choir. I encourage you, if you'd like to be a part of the choir, come out this evening. We, uh, we are just beginning. You're really not behind. You, we are beginning um, a, a new work, piece of music uh, for Easter. So excited about that. And uh, it's really good and looking forward to it. So uh, we've got a, bo- uh, a book that even though it doesn't have your name on it now, it will have if you'll just come out tonight. So uh, come out and be with us for choir practice. And then we normally always go over what we're going to be doing uh, on the next Lord's Day anyway. So enjoy that with us. All right. Turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 6. And find verse 1, Acts 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business." But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurius, and Nicornor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. This past Sunday, a week ago, the militant Islamic terrorist group ISIS released a video in which they claim to have beheaded 21 Egyptian Christians. Victims of the purported slaughter were all men of the Coptic Christian faith. They had been kidnapped in December and January and they were being held in a coastal town in eastern Libya which is now under the control of ISIS. The five minute video shows these terrified captives dressed in orange jumpsuits being marched in single file along a beach by executioners clad in black and welding daggers. The victims were forced to kneel in the sand before they were beheaded one by one. While the authenticity of this video is still murky, I think it does raise a lot of concerns about where we are in this world. And and, and my... My reasoning this morning is not to frighten anyone. Please understand that. I just want you to know, in case you don't already know, 
those of us who name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are a very, very hated people. And so much of that is because of our association with the Jewish people. As Christians, our Savior was a Jewish man as far as the man part of him. Of course, he was God, which has no Jewish Gentile reference. God doesn't have that. But as a man, Jesus was very much a Jew. And in light of the fact, I don't think anyone would argue that the Jewish people are the most hated people on the face of the earth. Anyone who aligns themselves with those people or anything associated with those people, they're going to be hated. They really are. When I heard of this video... And I do this a lot anymore. I trust normally the first thing that comes to my mind. And the story that follows this text was the first thing that came to my mind. We're going to go a little farther. You see, the verses we read really have to do with the ordaining or the setting apart of deacons. Here's our pattern. Here. And we have tried to stay true to that. But it's the verses that follow that really bring this story into play. Our focus is going to really be upon one of the men who were listed. His name was Stephen. Those 21 people who were purported to be beheaded, if that indeed happened, they were not the first. I don't say that to take away from what happened, as horrible as it is. But they weren't the first. In our text, we're going to find the first one. And I want to say before we get to that, I don't mean that Stephen was the first person who was ever killed for his faith. No. No, you can go back in the Old Testament and find all kinds of people who suffered because of their faith in God, even to the point of death. But Stephen was the first. In the economy of what we call church dispensation, church age. Because that's much of what the book of Acts is about. It's the Acts of the Apostles in the formation and the carrying out of the church as we know it. Stephen. Stephen was the first Christian martyr of the church. One of the verses, and we'll comment more on it in a moment, one of the verses spoke of him being full of the Holy Spirit. So I want to build everything. There's three points. I want to build everything around that. Here was a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. Understand, all who are believers have the Holy Spirit living within them. If you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you, no matter what you call yourself or no matter what you're a member of, you're not a saved person. Because the Holy Spirit moves into anyone who is saved. And He stays there. Contrary to what 
some teach. He stays there. But it's one thing, it's one thing to possess the Holy Spirit. And it's another thing for the Holy Spirit to possess you. And Stephen was a man who was possessed by the Holy Spirit. Three things. That being possessed of the Holy Spirit allowed him to do. First, it allowed him to serve. He was filled with the Holy Spirit to serve. That's what deacons are. They're servants. And while in our economy today and in, in our way of looking things, sometimes the ideal of a servant takes on something as being menial. But in the kingdom of God, being a servant is a wonderful thing. It's a place of elevation. Being a servant and there's two or three things that we'll look at in the text and then we'll get into some of the verses that followed that we didn't read. But I think it would be good to get to know Stephen just a little bit. First, he was a good man. The men who were chosen for this office, and there were six others, make no doubt about it, but our focus is on him because of what happened to him. It was said of these men that they were to be men of honest report. That's very important. These were men who had good standing in the community. Their reputation was good. Even to the point of what Scripture says is above reproach. Does that mean perfect, sinless, no. No. Deacons are no more perfect and sinless than pastors are. We share that. If anybody ever tells you their pastor is perfect and sinless, then you can just kind of write that off. He may be the greatest guy in the world. But he still thinks things he shouldn't think and says things he shouldn't say after he's been to some meetings and things and, and dealt with some things. He, he, he does that because he's a human being. He's not perfect. And as wonderful as the men are who serve in our church, they're not perfect. But what it does mean is that they lived their lives in such a way that people spoke well of them. That's what that term means of good report. He was a good man. More important, he was a godly man. Verse 3, and I focused on it a moment ago, also tells us that they were to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. The Bible bears it out clearly that there's blessing in a multitude of people. There are denominations of churches and I'm not, I'm not going to be critical of that. I don't have, I'm, you know, I'm just a Baptist. But there are certain denominations who, who will not have deacons. I had a pastor tell me one time, I don't have them. They're just troublemakers. Yeah. Just troublemakers. So that pastor pretty much calls every shot. There's nothing done in that church financially. Nothing. Unless he gives the A-OK. The -A -okay. Now I'm going to be honest with you. If I was a member of that church, I'd struggle with that. I have a voice. And I want that voice to be made known. But that's enough of that. If those people believe that, that's between them and God. But these servants, these servants of God, 
were filled with the Holy Spirit. Because there's going to be times when you get together and we've had this happen so many times, particularly in the last few years, when you get together and you need some advice. So you put men in that office who are wise. If the pastor calls all the shots, That's going to be the only direction you have. But if you have other men of God who are filled with the Holy Spirit, there's times, and I've seen this happen, that someone would bring up a point and said, guys, have you thought about this? And the rest of the room goes, no. We haven't thought about that. That's why it's so important to get that input. And that's why you put wise men in that office. It has nothing to do with intellect whatsoever. It's wisdom that's God-given. He was a good man. He was a godly man. He was a gifted man. Now drop down in verse 8. You still there? Acts 6. And Stephen, he singled out here, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. I've got to believe these other six guys were great guys. But the Holy Spirit pulls Stephen out. Because the Holy Spirit knew that Stephen was full of him the Holy Spirit. So he singles him out. What does that term mean? Miracles. I think it means just exactly what it said. I think the apostolic authority was on Stephen to the point that he would go out and he would lay hands on people, much like Christ did. He would lay hands on people, realizing that Power was not really Stephen. It was he who was in him. He would lay hands on the sick. They would recover. When it says miracles, I think it says just what it's saying. It's the same word if you search it in the Greek. It's the same word that was used to speak of Jesus. Same word. By the way, in the book of Acts, he's not the only one. There are times that you see Peter having this same authority. Paul, numerous times. But Stephen is singled out because he is a good man, he's a godly man, and he's a gifted man. Filled with the Holy Spirit to serve. Now let's go a little farther. He was filled not only with the Holy Spirit to serve, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit to speak. To speak. When you go around in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you do miracles, especially in that day and time, it get you in trouble. And it got him in trouble. The religious authorities were in a panic. What are we going to do? They couldn't discount the miracles. And the people were beginning to flock to those who were supporting Christianity, but the groves and the religious people got in an uproar. So they bring them in. They bring Stephen in, in particular. We see him, first of all, debating the truth. Look in verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, these are these are religious people, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing, that literally means to debate with Stephen. I love this. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. It's a beautiful picture. You got all these guys in here 
It's kind of like it was on Mount Carmel. You've got all these prophets of Baal out there and they're doing all this and, and then you've just got one man of God who calls fire down from heaven. You've got all these people in this courtroom setting and they're lying. They're trumping up charges. Sound familiar? It's what they did to Jesus. They're lying. They're doing everything they can to try to raise up a Pharaoh against Stephen. <laughs> but every time they come at him with something, he counters it. He just lays them out. That's literally what that verse means. Tim, he was a trade out if there's ever been one. Love that guy. Yeah. He just lays them out. So they come from another direction. They try something else. Guess what? He just lays them out. You know why? Because it wasn't him. It was the Holy Spirit within him. He was so full of the Holy Ghost of God that he probably said something and he probably said, Whew, where'd that come from? Thank you, Lord. That's what was happening. And no matter how hard they tried, he just laid them aside. In chapter 7, we see him not only debating the truth, but defending the truth. Now he's going to focus on the Jews. And if anybody got up one day and said, what can I do today to get killed? It would have probably have been Stephen. Because the Jewish people, as religious people, who, these are the ones who has brought him to this tribunal and he just unloads on them. First, he spoke of their heritage. He speaks of the heritage of the Jews. Look in verse 2. He says, men, brethren, and fathers. Now here's a Jew talking to Jews. So he wants them to know right up front, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not a Gentile who's read, uh, I'm one of you. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham and when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharan and said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into a land where I shall show thee. He goes all the way back and he brings in patriarchs, father Abraham and these wonderful men of Jewish heritage and he reminds them that there was a time that you were in bondage but God used one, raised up one, speaks of Moses speaks of others who brought them out of that bondage he wants that on their mind he's telling them do you realize what a heritage you have simply because you're Jewish? Do you realize that God chose you? That'll not get you popular today to go around preaching and telling people, I support and love the Jewish people. There's a lot of circles that won't be popular in. But folks, whether it's popular or not, it doesn't change the fact that God did. You say, well, I thought God was no respecter of persons. He didn't. And by the way, God did not choose the Jewish people because he's up there one day looking down and said, mm, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I need some people. Maybe that bunch. No. No, he looked at the heart of men like Abraham and he saw in that heart a desire to want to serve him. And that so impressed God, and it takes a lot to impress God, that so impressed him that he said, that's the people. 
Those are going to be my people. And that tiny little nation, even in all their blindness, that tiny little nation that's surrounded on every border by people that hate them, they're still God's people. They are still God's people. Make no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I'll be honest with you. When I read the news and hear about things going on, I try to keep abreast. But when it comes to Israel, I don't get worried a whole lot. The future holds some bad times for the Jewish people. But that's well in the future. We're not at that point now. I don't worry about the Jewish people. They might suffer a minimal loss. But let me tell you, God is going to protect those people because they are His. His people. And He's reminding them of this great heritage that God chose them. But then it really starts going downhill because He not only reminds them of their heritage, He reminds them of their hardness. Hard-heartedness. In verses 9, th 9 through 17, we're not going to read it all. He recount, uh, recounts the horrible treatment that their fathers had lashed out against Joseph. He goes all the way back and talks about how Joseph was treated. His own people, his own brethren. And that every step of his life was chronicled to the point that every time that you thought, well, oh, Joseph, he's done away from that. No. Nope. No. And he eventually assumes a place where he's at the very right hand of the Pharaoh, second in charge. In verses uh, 18 through 36, he speaks of Moses. I talked about it a moment ago. The liberator who God raised up to lead his people out of Egypt. They hadn't been out of Egypt no time until they come to the Red Sea. And every one of them had to be Baptist. They started griping and complaining. Well, thank you for bringing us out here. Was there not enough graveyards in Egypt to bury us? You're going to bring us out here so we can be buried in the desert? It's griped, complained. God did a miracle. They got a cross. They got hungry and God fed them from heaven. They didn't have anything to drink. God gives them something to drink from a rock. Yeah. And they griped and complained the whole time. Now he's talking to Jewish religious leaders. They don't want to hear this. It's the truth. In verses 37 through 43, he reminds them of that event at Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and he's gone for quite a while and there's thunders and lightnings and everything going on on top of the mountain and, and the people begin to talk and say, our leader's gone, he's dead. He's went up there and God's killed him. We need us a God. So they gather up all the, the, the gold they can and, and precious jewels and, and they make them an idol and they worship something they made. Makes no sense whatsoever. Absolutely none. He reminds them of that. It must have looked like that, that table did when I was talking last two Sundays ago about Darrell Waltrip when he made his statement about if you, you fellows don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to hell when you die. I imagine, I imagine the audience out there when Stephen was talking must have looked like that. In fact, it gets so bad that if you read the text, they're standing up and they're going, we don't want to hear this. They didn't want to hear it. You see why I said a moment ago if a man got up one day and decided, hmm, what can I do today to get killed? It would have been Stephen. Yeah. He was filled with the Holy Spirit to serve. He was filled with the Holy Spirit to speak. 
We see him defending the truth, debating the truth, and declaring the truth. Look in verse 51. Stephen returns to the focus of his accusers and he reminds them of the hardness of their hearts because he brings Jesus Christ into play. He said, the God of our fathers sent his anointed to this earth. And I think he pointed fingers and he said, you crucified him. You crucified the Lord of glories. It's at that point that they just lose it. They just lose it. All over the building, they're saying, silence him. We don't want to hear this. told the truth. Folks, the only way you can do that is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit to serve, to speak, and to suffer. To suffer. And there's two things about his suffering that I want to point. First of all, it was voluntary. He suffered voluntarily. Look in verse 54. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed out on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The place is in a frenzy running around the room. Hands over their ears, gnashing in their teeth, grinding their teeth together because of the bitterness and hatred in their heart for what Stephen said. Stephen, on the other hand, this is so cool. He's just standing there and he looks up to heaven. I think he is at perfect peace. He looks up into heaven and he sees the heavens open. You know, by the way, every indication is that those other people, they don't see this. There is is nothing in Scripture that indicates that they saw what he saw. They don't see it. He looks up and he sees heaven open and he sees the Son of God standing looking down. Now let me show you why that's so important. When Jesus finished His work, Colossians tells us that He went back to heaven where He is what? Seated. Seated at the right hand of God. In virtually every reference you see in Scripture, it pictures the Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God. But I feel in my heart that when the Lord Jesus Christ saw the atrocity that was happening and knew what was going to happen, we're not finished yet, that He stood up and looked down on this earth. You see, Stephen was about to join him. And I think the Lord just stood there and welcomed him home. That's that's what I feel. He stood. We do that sometimes when someone important comes into a room. We stand up. I believe Jesus stood up. Because Stephen not only suffered voluntarily, he suffered victoriously. Look in verse 57. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Watch this, verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet. A young man whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. This is amazing. Saying, Lord, lay not this sin on their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. 
I read a little bit. It said that there was places built for stoning. And there was a center section. And it was almost like a pedestal. And they put the person who was going to be stoned, they tied them to this pedestal. And all those who were a part of this stoning had rocks gathered around. And one person, one, one person. It sounds awful, but it was almost like being at the carnival. Trying to knock down a bearer with a ball. One person picked up a stone and hurled it. Now he possibly would have hit the person who was being stoned in a place where that wouldn't have taken his life. So another said, let me have a shot at him. He picks up a stone and he throws it. And this continues on and on and on until someone, someone hits a headshot. Then when the person has been knocked for what appears to be and totally dead, they loosen up these ropes and the person falls down into this pit and everybody says, okay guys, have at it. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that barbaric? That's what they did. That's what they did. There's two things happened and we're closing. There was two things happened at that point that's so important. Number one, heaven, heaven received a saint. I still, I still see Jesus standing up there saying, welcome home, Stephen. Welcome home. You fought a good fight. You kept the faith. Welcome home. But there's something else. You see, not only did heaven receive a saint, but earth received a servant. Don't skip over that little part in there where it says that they laid the clothes and they singled out a particular person. They laid the clothes at the feet of Saul. And there's a lot of people in the Bible named Saul. Who's this guy? Well, you'll know him better as Saul of Tarsus. Yeah, that guy. He's the same guy that would pick up the fight and try to destroy the church. Same guy. Who on the Damascus Road to try to get papers to have some of these same things done to other Christians. He's on a mission. Same guy. The Lord Jesus Christ strikes him to the earth with his face in the dirt. And that day, Saul of Tarsus was converted. And he was changed from Saul of Tarsus to Paul, arguably the greatest Christian outside of the Lord Jesus Christ that ever walked the face of the earth. A man who wrote more books, who was the human instrument to write more books than any other author in the Bible. Heaven got a saint. The earth got a servant. If the deeds of last week did happen, it is an atrocity. And I don't want to take anything away from that fact. It's horrendous to think that a people would do something like this in the name of religion and in their book that they revere so highly. They will give you verse and chapter that says they have the right and authority to do this. Yeah. If that happened, they weren't the first. And again, my... Reason is not to 
cause you to be fearful. It's, it's to educate you and remind you that we are very, very hated people in this world. Make no doubt about it. I pray to God that if I'm ever in a situation like that, I'd love to just stand up here and guarantee you. But I'm wise enough not to do that. I pray to God that if I'm ever in a situation like that, that I would stand boldly. I really do. That I would stand boldly. Even looking at the consequences right in the face, that I would stand boldly. Because I want you to remember that little scene I painted a moment ago. Jesus getting up off of his right hand seat, walking over, looking over the banister of heaven and saying, welcome home, child of God. Let's bow together. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Are you sure? Are you certain? Are you certain? If you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray in just a moment, and girls, we are going to sing a verse or two. I pray in just a moment that if God speaks to you, you'll come. Come and be gloriously saved. It can happen. It can happen. And if as a child of God you say, Ronnie, I know I am, but I feel just like you a moment ago. I'd like to think that I would have the boldness of Stephen, but that's what I'd like to think. You may feel like coming down this morning and saying, Lord, help me with all the uncertainty in this world. If I'm ever in a situation similar to this, and it may not be anything this radical. It may just be on your job standing up. Young people, it may be at school standing up and not being ashamed to be a Christian. Say, Ronnie, I want that. If God speaks to you this morning and you feel you need to come down and pray, do that. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we can find comfort in even the hardest and most horrible of all situations. Father, I pray for every Christian on this earth. These are very, very unsettling times. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give all of us courage and boldness to be able to stand for you irregardless of what we face. And Lord, I also pray if there's someone here who has never given their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that they come and trust Him. Whatever you would challenge us to do by your Holy Spirit, help us to be responsive. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're singing hymn.